Join me. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You'll need a Bible. We'll be referring back to it. Um, so I just want to give you fair warning. One of the things that we do here is, is at some point during the sermon, sometime between one and three times, you awkwardly stare at four or five people around you and you discuss a question that I'll put up on the board. That's going to happen. It's about halfway through, so introverts mentally prepare yourself. You might want to look behind you just real quick just to see who you might accidentally have to talk to. Um, but, but we know that things are better when we engage with other people, whether it's fun for us or exciting, whatever. There's something wondrous that happens. I'm going to say particularly last week if you were here, right? The feedback from people sharing was so meaningful, um, and so I was just so encouraged by that, even while I was preaching. So, so just, just be aware, we're not starting this week out with one, but I want us to, to, to get us into what's going on. All right. Have you ever gotten, raise your hand if you've received a letter in the last five years that you wanted. Not like, I'm not talking like junk mail, we have an offer. You know, like they now they like print things and pretend like it's handwritten. You know what I'm talking about? You know in the letter where there's like, it's the really nice stuff at the beginning, and then partway through the letter, there's a shift in tone. Has anyone ever received one of those letters before? This is one of those moments in, the God, in this part of 1 Corinthians. In the first four chapters, Paul's setting it up, and now it's like, okay, you know that awkward thing that you avoid talking about when you're with family? You know what that is, right? If you don't, you should talk to your family about what the awkward thing is that you bring up that no one else wants to talk about. But this is one of those moments with Paul in this church in this town of Corinth. By the way, Rachel, at some point, I want you to email me pictures because Rachel's actually been to Corinth and I'll have you show some pictures and talk about you walking around there because that would be way cool. I never got to be there. Just remind me at some point, right? And Paul's gonna make just a gigantic seismic shift in this letter, and this whole next two plus months, all we're going to be talking about is the significant relationships in our life. We're going to talk, fair warning, about husbands and wives and getting married, to marry or not to marry. We're going to talk about the ugly parts of relationships. We're going to talk about the beautiful parts of relationship. And we're going to talk about the incredibly messy reality of doing life with other people. We're going to talk about singleness, friendship. Today, we're talking about romantic relationships. We'll talk about legal disputes and all these things. And as this, you got to remember, this is a young, passionate church in Corinth. And sometimes when you're young and passionate, you're, you're really wrong and you're very confident that you are right, right? And, and what we're going to find for these next three chapters is that Paul's going to help them unveil through a line of questions, and then just some straight-up correction, some places where they've just missed what God's best was for them and the people around them. So, uh, oh, I think I, this is good. Parents listened. Awesome. Uh, so, I just want to warn you, in our section today, Paul's going to deal with some uh, unrepentant, which means just repent means to turn. Right? So, so I'm going to say repent probably 85 times today. All repent means is making a 180 degree turn. Right? It's going one direction and then turning another. Our, our passage today is going to be about someone who is engaging in a very poor life choice. And, and, we're gonna, and Paul's going to unveil for us how we deal with unrepentant sin among, uh, among God's people in the church. And how to engage with people who aren't yet followers of Jesus. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that getting this right is one of the most important things that we'll do as followers of Jesus and as a church, right? Our integrity and ability to be an effective witness will determine the impact that we have as we share the good news with other people. And so as we started out the service with, I'm going to read a passage from Romans chapter 1. It, it for me has been a companion this week as I've walked through this passage um, because some of these things that we're going to say are a little difficult in our moment and in our time, right? Because God has boundaries on sexual expression where God says inside these boundaries are beautiful and wonderful things to be found and outside of them, really rough things are found for us and the people around us. So I'm just going to read this. Paul said this as he was talking to this church in Rome. He said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for what? For salvation to everyone who believes. 
right? We are saying these truths of the gospel not because we want other people, right? We're sharing these truths of the gospel so that God's salvation, his rescue, can come upon us in the present and for eternity in the future. And today we unashamedly proclaim the gospel and how we engage in our fallen sexual desires and how we engage with people acting outside of God's will inside the church and outside. Because I'm warning you, if you treat them both the same, you're going to be wrong in one or both places. And so here, let's pray and then we're going to jump in to chapter 5 verse 1. Lord, may we today as we open up your word, repent of those things where our actions and our thoughts do not honor you. Lord, may we believe the truth of your word and follow you on this costly, narrow path of righteousness that you beckon us to follow. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's jump in. Grab your Bibles. You're going to need it. Chapter 5, verse 1. Here's what Paul says. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not even tolerated among the pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. All right. Please, I'm just asking one request. Give me 35 minutes to explain why this is such a big deal. At some point, something here will push on a sensibility of yours, like it did for me this week. Please walk with me all the way to the end. Does that make sense? Don't, don't disengage partway through. Hear the fullness of what Paul's saying, because salvation and good news is there for each of us. All right. This term, and it's going to be repeated over and over for the next few chapters, of sexual immorality is this Greek word pornea. And it's a broad term. It's a term that describes any sexual practice outside of God's intended will. Right? God made these really clear boundaries that, that sexual expression is to be manifest in two ways. And we're going to talk about what the two clear things that Scripture says about it. This isn't a sermon about it, but we need this framework to understand what he's calling us. Okay, here are the two things. If you want to go back, I talked through this when we went through Malachi. Scripture clearly teaches that there are two God-honoring ways for us to put into action our sexual desires. First one is in what? It's in marriage, Right? The, right, that this, this sexual desire in marriage and the covenant between one man and one woman, when they come together and express that together, God calls it good. There are two things, though, that God says are good in this life. And the second one is singleness. It's these desires of sexual express, sexual desire expressed in the beauty of abstinence and self control. Can I just tell you, it is possible. Right? We have 2,000 years of examples of people who have done that. And so, so on this baseline, when we're talking about sexual immorality, we're talking about sexual expression in any of its forms outside of heterosexual marriage between one man and one woman or abstinence and self-control on your own. Does that make sense? So I, I'm not going to talk about that again, but I'm going I'm to assume that the whole rest of the way through so we can track. And, and I'm just going to say there are places where there's some wiggle room in Scripture. I'm just warning you, this is not one of those spots, right? There's no way to take Scripture seriously, right, and not be on the same page with this one. And, and this is costly in our moment in our culture, but I just want you to know, like, if we're devoting ourselves fully to Scripture, these are the only two things that for 2,000 years Christians have all agreed upon of what that looks like. And I'm going to say, Scripture is not written in a vacuum. This this passage was written to a group of followers of Jesus in Greece in the first century. And I'm going to tell you, the reason Paul's going to spend a lot of time talking about relationships is because relationships in Greece in the first century were repugnant. They were terrible. They were awful. They assumed so many horrific things were okay. And when the gospel goes into each culture, there are things that the culture has to do as it works out what it means to follow Jesus there. And because the picture of the culture and the picture of the gospel in Greece at this point are radically different, Paul spends a lot of time writing about this when he's talking to the Corinthians. 
And I would say, uh, I I wanted to show you two examples of what this would look like. So, So this is a common phrase that the Greeks would say among themselves. They would say this, mistresses we keep for the sake of pleasure, concubines for the daily care of the body, but wives to bear us legitimate children. This is just the cultural norm. Read it one more time. Mistresses we keep for the sake of pleasure, concubines for the daily care of the body, but wives to bear us legitimate children. Is that awful? Yes or no? Right? This is terrible. Right? That's just awful. Like, this is okay, good, expected, normal in first century Corinth. If you weren't doing this, you're a weirdo. Complicated to go from that, right? This also had the Temple of Aphrodite at it with 3,000 prostitutes right in the middle of the city. Huge, gigantic complex, right? It was a city and a people obsessed with fulfilling and satiating their sexual desires. Can I just warn you? Is it just because we have a desire, does that make that desire good? No, right? Or all of us would be in jail at some point, Right? Because we do think, right? Anyway, never mind. You've never driven in big cities, you'd find that out. Anyway, so, so here's what's going on in the church. Someone who is most likely a leader, because Paul's just addressed leaders for the last chapter plus, is actively, continually, and unrepentantly sleeping with his stepmom. So that, that's what Paul's correcting right here. Right? Like, Paul's writing a letter to tell them, hey, you probably shouldn't sleep with your stepmom. Amen. There we go. Great. (laughs) Sorry. And and so we know it's stepmother, not mother, or they use a completely different Greek word. And and at this time, these are all multi-generational families. They're living together in one spot together. And what's happening is so terrible is the people who said that, 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 like, that their cultural maxim, that proverb I just read, right? They were disgusted by the actions of this Christian in Corinth, right? They're making the Corinthians blush. And, and we know for sure this, this word has or have, depending on what you're, what you're reading, like that he's doing that. It's this picture of happening continually in the present and into the future. We know that this person's been corrected and they're like, yeah, but it feels right. So they continue on with that. And, and, and it's pretty clear that at this point that the follower of Jesus, the stepmom, was not yet a follower of Jesus and the male was, or Paul would be correcting who? Both people. Right? Paul just corrects the follower of Jesus on their behavior. Just remember the people who said, mistresses we keep for the sake of pleasure, concubines for the daily care of the body, but wives to bear legitimate children were disgusted and outraged by the moral actions of the church. When the Corinthians need to look to the Greek normative world in the first century around them for a sexual corrective in action, you know there's a significant problem. And the greater issue is that everybody knows about it. Do you know, does Paul name the person? No. Why doesn't Paul name the person? Why do you think? Non-rhetorical. Why do you think Paul doesn't name the person? Because they all know. Who said that? That was great. Because they all know. Everybody knows who it is. Right? Because they don't even think what they're doing is a bad thing. Right? Because if it feels right, it must be right, right? Said First Polonians chapter nowhere, right? No, it's a terror. It's an insane thought. And it's really fascinating. So he's, he gives this picture of what's going on. He gives an, an immediate critique of the leadership about not doing anything about it. And then in verse two, he calls them arrogant for the second time in six verses. Like, I, I find that particularly odd, that they would be proud and arrogant based on their response to the relationship. But I'm going to say, if you look around at followers of Jesus, there are some times where we are very rejoicing in our transgression. Does it feel good? I mean, let's just, okay, for the rule breakers other than me, who is a rule breaker by nature? Like, if there's a rule, you just want to be like, right there. Anyone else? Come on. Actually, put your hand up if you're a rule breaker. You're not a rule breaker. Interesting. Okay. Anyway, right? There is a pleasure that we get from breaking the rules. Yes? 
right? If you don't know that, go babysit a toddler. If you don't believe me, go find someone with a toddler and offer to babysit, right? There's something that they enjoy about, ha ha, I'm not, t- don't touch it. What, what, the, what does a three-year-old do when you say don't touch it? <laughs> right? Right? And there's this fallen nature, and we have that. Often we see this as followers of Jesus, that sometimes we pride ourselves on breaking rules that we don't like. But, but Paul's going to give us a different way. So, so here's what he says. He says, you guys are celebrating. You should be mourning, right? And he has a solution. And what's Paul's solution to what the man's doing? What's his solution? Come on, it's not complicated. Can you put it back up verse two real quick, Emily? What does he say? Remove him. Bye-bye. All right. I'm going to come back to that. Paul's going to explain why. So Paul, from the very beginning, gives us the problem, the solution, and he's going to spend the rest of it filling that space in between. Has anyone ever asked a boss, hey, why? And they say, because I said so. How well does that work? Will, will you do it? Maybe. It depends who your boss is, right? But are you going to do it when they're not looking? Very unlikely. Paul is going to explain the why for the rest of our time. So let's pick it up. If you would, grab your Bible in verse 3. And you're going to need it because you're going to switch to another passage that won't be fully up on the screen. Paul says this, For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are delivered this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. All right, two things. I know you've probably seen a Marvel movie. It's not some like weird astral pro- like projection moment. Paul's saying, my authority goes with this letter. It's like I'm standing among you. That's what he's saying in this first proud. And, and like, this is my judgment. So, so here's what I'd like you to do. If you would, open up your Bibles, go over to the book of Matthew. So if you're in First Corinthians, just go left for a while right? You're going to hit John, Luke, keep going, Mark, keep going, Matthew. And I want you to go to chapter seven. It's up on the screen, but it's just small for those of you who can't see. So, so Paul's clearly make is Paul making a judgment right here? Yes or no? Yes, he absolutely. He is making a judgment. So here's what I like you. I'm going to read this passage for you, and then I'm going to send you into those groups of four or five people. I've got a question for you to talk through together. Okay, let me read this. Here's what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. All right, I got a question coming right here. So, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to, act, to go ahead and awkwardly stare at some people. They'll su- the extrovert will stop t- start talking. Don't be afraid. So do you think that Paul is following Jesus's, like, with his, is, is Paul being judgmental, yes or no? There's your question, okay? You, you, read, you, read, you read Jesus say, don't be judgmental, right? Is Paul doing that? Why or why not? You've got two minutes in your group to solve this theological dilemma. On your mark, get set, stop looking at me, look at the passage, and awkwardly stare. I promise someone will talk. Look back, look forward. You got two minutes, go.
All right, I got four pages left, so we got to bring it back together. We'll be all right. There's no music after the sermon. Don't be afraid when your stomach's growling. When I stop, it all stops. All right, listen up. So I'm curious. I want to hear, do you think that Paul is following what Jesus says in this judgment, yes or no? So for some people who said yes, why, why, why do you say yes? Yes, right. If you have a log in your eye, great. And there's a speck in your brother's. It's, it's, a, it, it's not helpful. You, can you help them if you have a log in your eye? No. All right, great. Yeah. Yeah, right. It says in there to judge to the method you like to be judged. So Paul's asking himself to be judged that he's okay at this point if he's not sleeping with his stepmom. Right? No, I'm, I'm right. That's the implication of that. Great. I think that it's important to know that Paul is only a vessel of the truth and not that God has people with God. Got it. Yeah. Oh, great. Explain that. It's not judging. What do you mean by that? Got it. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Awesome. What else? Go. So what he's saying is we're supposed to judge the action, not the person. At least that's what I got from it. Yes. But with Paul judging this man, they're both believers. We are told not to judge non-believers. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm fairly certain we can keep our brothers and sisters in Christ on the right path. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Let's, any, any, other, any other thoughts other than that that came up in your groups? I'm interested. I did have one earlier. Okay. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, you're clearly a rule breaker. We'll get to our self identification at the end. I'm talking to the religious and the rule breakers later. Don't worry, I'm mocking both. Go. Yeah, interesting. Paul's not judging; he's teaching, right? He's dividing that line between right and wrong. All right. Anyone else have a thought? Last call. I've got a whole bunch of thoughts, but I wanna. All right. Anyone says, yes, Paul is judging and it's wrong. Let's hear it. No one's going to be bold? Just to be adversarial? Say it again. All I'm saying is what is the alternative to the justice of justice? Oh, okay. Some people are held to higher standards. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. All right, that's great. I'm going to pretend you didn't say that, though, because I'm going to say that in like 97 seconds, so we'll wait on that. Anyway, two great quotes from commentaries on this. I feel like they can, what they can say in like six words, I'll say in five minutes and be less impactful. So just, it's going to be up on the screen. I just want to read it. It's just so good. Here's what he says. While Christians are not to judge one another's motives, right, because do we know each other's hearts? On a scale from one to not, what is it? Like, just if, if you're there, just you, you, you have no idea what's happening in another person's heart. Stop trying. All right. While Christians are not to judge one another's motives or ministries, we are certainly expected to be honest about each other's conduct. Does that make sense? Right? Like, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk implications in a little bit on this. Right? I'm going to I would argue that Paul's not being disobedient in any way shape or form in this moment. And I would say we live in a culture that the greatest societal ill is to be judgmental, right? How terrible would you be? Right? But guess what? Is, is everybody judgmental to a certain extent? Right? Or everyone would just be like anyone who asks for their money, sure, yeah, you can have my money. You know, everyone's trustworthy. Right? We all make judgments about other people, right? But there's a clear line here that Jesus was teaching. And so we see him, uh, Jesus is forbidding hypocritical judgment, right? That's like, say what I say, not what I do, right? Right, it's, it's the person who will say, bless your heart, right? And then the second your back's turned, destroy you. Paul is perfectly willing to apply the same standards to himself that he's applying to other people. 
And as followers of Jesus, I'm going to go on like a 45-second like aside. We call this church discipline. Everyone's super excited. Say church discipline. Right? This super exciting thing. I know you woke up this morning like, man, I really hope we talk about church discipline. It, but I'm going to tell you. So I, I want to quickly explain what it is because it's a really big deal. Church discipline has two purposes. Right? When there's someone whose conduct, who's a follower of Jesus, is out of control and we invite them to make other choices and they're like, no, I'm right, you're wrong, it's okay, or just I don't care. Here's what we do. It's twofold. So the first thing you do with church discipline is you protect hurting, vulnerable, or victimized people inside or outside the church. Right? If a follower of Jesus is victimizing someone, guess what? In a nice way, we don't care about them first. Does that make sense? Are they our first concern? Do churches blow this sometimes, yes or no? The answer is yes, emphatically yes. <laughs> the restoration of that person is <laughs> much lower importance than the protection of vulnerable people. Just so we're all clear on that, there's no ifs, ands, buts, or maybe. So the first thing is to protect hurting, vulnerable, and victimized people inside and outside of the church. And second, the purpose of this is for repentance and restoration of the person to Jesus and the church. Are there some things that you can do in this life that you can't be welcomed back into the community for? The answer is what? Yes, exactly, yes. Now, Right? Those things are few and far between and almost always criminal. Does that make sense? Right? And so we bless them to go to prison. Right? You think I'm kidding? No, I want. I want people who abuse women and children to go to prison. Is that fair? I think that seems like a good thing to want. I think that's a great place for them. If we disagree, we can meet this week and talk. So church discipline, the priority is always on the victim, not the victimizer. But the hope is that that person is able to restore to God and restore to God's people. Can you love and follow Jesus without a community very well for very long? Only if you're delusional, right? That's it's just not how it works. And I just want to be clear, when Paul talks about, let's go back. I just don't want you to misunderstand. I can't do everything in this. But when Paul talks about in verse 5, you deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, when Paul's talking about flesh, is he talking about his physical body? Yes or no? The answer is no, right? When he talks about flesh, Paul, Paul, that, that's synonymous with sin nature. You and I, we've all had little kids. Are they sweet and innocent? Yes, in the beginning. Are they, sin, are they perfectly sinless with a wholesome heart at all times right from the beginning? No, right? Like my nephews, never mind. Anyway, right? They just like beat each other because they love each other. But they just, you know, they just wail on each other. So, so I'm saying, Paul in this moment isn't talking about destroying the man's physical body, how much you, however much you might want that to happen. But instead, it's addressing the spiritual power of his sinful flesh. I got one more quote, and then we're going to move on to this next section. Same guy. He says this, church discipline is not a group of pious policemen out to catch a criminal. Rather, it's a group of broken-hearted brothers and sisters seeking to restore an erring member of the family. Paul just spent four chapters being really clear about how much he loved them, calling them his beloved children, right? And giving his life and heart. He's like, what? It's like when your kid makes that choice and you watch it as a parent. You guys, if you've been there, right, and just your heart sinks when they make that choice and you're like, come on. Right? And this is one of those moments Paul's doing this so that the man may understand what the fruit of these decisions will be for him and the people around him. And I'm going to say, as followers of Jesus, we have a tendency to, to, to do this correction wrong in one of two ways. Right? And, and, and what, I'm just telling you, in general, right, we're going to want to go down one pathway or another, and it's incredibly important to know what your proclivity is. First of us, some of us will want to correct nothing in the people around us. And can I warn you, what will that do to those people? It will bring utter and complete destruction to their life. If you see a car careening down a road where you know there's a cliff a quarter mile down and you say nothing, that's an immoral act. So some of us are prone, and I would say probably myself, I'm going to all self-identify on this, like this is my lane, Right? It's very costly to say something because sometimes you're wrong or sometimes they just leave. 
The second proclivity that people have is to correct everything in everyone else's life around them. Have you ever met this person? No, you've never had their. Like, how pleasant are they to be around? It's rough. Right? And some of us have this same sinful proclivity on the other side. We look at the people around us. We're trying to judge hearts. We're trying to judge motives all the time, trying to figure out if they're doing it right. Does that make sense? And we spend our time looking around at other people, comparing ourselves to them, right? There is a sinful proclivity in both. But I'm going to say both of them outside of the framing and boundaries of God's word and the example of Jesus will bring destruction to people's life if we walk either path unchecked by the gospel. So Paul's going to give us next an image to help us understand what he's saying and what this looks like. So pick it up in verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that even a little leaven... What? Let me try that again. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lope, lope, lump? Wow. <laughs> cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. I've not read this out loud. This sounds very different than it did in my head. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. All right, one more commentary. Let's read this. At the Passover feast, all leaven was to be removed from the house. And nothing with leaven was to be eaten for a whole week. Paul says that just as the Jews were concerned to remove all the leaven from their midst during this Passover ceremony, so the church should have a concern to remove such notorious, unrepentant sinners from their midst. Right, in the leaven, they're talking about, how many of you ever made bread? Anyone made sour? Raise your hand if you made sourdough. All right, sounds good. All right, then you guys know what I'm talking about. For the rest of us who don't bake things, right? The leaven here mentioned isn't merely yeast, but it's a pinch of dough left over from the previous batch that you would work into the next batch when you're making the bread. Right? It, and this was commonly leavened in the ancient world, and it would cause it to puff up. I'm pretty sure you're just putting bacteria or fungus inside there, which is really disgusting to think about. But then you bake it, so it's okay. Right? And, and this, this whole point of it was to illustrate, if you work that leaven into the loaf, does it affect the whole thing? Right? And he's saying it's the same thing with sin in our lives. That if we allow open unrepentant, boastful sinning as a church, it's going to destroy the church. I want to talk about why. I'm going to, I'm going to share a story where I've seen this. Um, I was leading a small group at my previous church about eight years ago. And, and the person who was hosting and co-leading with me decided that she had a really cute co-worker at work. She started uh, making adult choices that she shouldn't with her coworker at work. Her husband, who I'd met with for the year and a half before, was like inches from getting baptized and inches from the kingdom. She's a believer. He's still working on where he's at. And when it came to light, she continued. She was like, it doesn't feel wrong, so it can't be wrong. And her two friends that come close to her and were super buddied up ended up doing the same thing within the next six months. And three families utterly and completely destroyed by the unrepentant sin of one person who said, hey, you know what? It feels right. He likes me. I love it. I feel wonderful afterwards. And it's this heartbreaking image. As I was reading this. It was just like people and moments and places where if we don't deal with some of this root cause, it works into the whole loaf. And we don't just do it because we care about the person, but, but that's going to get worked into the whole loaf. And guess what? Anytime we normalize sinful behavior as followers of Jesus, we tell the people around us that it's okay when it's not. And I know, are, are, we, are we perfect people, people? Come on. No, but we can't celebrate the evil that we do. We mourn it. And 
And I just, I, I'm just going to, well, we'll be five minutes over. We'll all survive. Can I just say, the most common conversation I have with people who aren't yet followers of Jesus is about followers of Jesus they know that told them what they should believe and, didn't, and lived a life no different from theirs. Can I just tell you, it's not just about it destroying the church. It destroys your opportunity to ever share the gospel with someone for the rest of your life. Like, I know people who have shut the door to the gospel for 50 years because of this. I've watched people wait that long to come back to know the Lord, right? Just because a follower of Jesus found these things okay. All right, let's do this real quick. So, so, so I want to quickly, we're going to finish up this section. We're going to do one more and then pop in. So, so here's how we treat sin within the church. I'm going to put up on the screen. Okay. If we see someone driving off a cliff and we don't say anything, it's our own fault. We, we have some culpability in that. Now, if you say something and they don't listen to you, can you control that? Right? Can you control the actions of other people? No. But if you see someone going down a road where you know there's going to be destruction, we're required as a people of God to take a risk. Now, it's not your preference. It's not what you want. We're talking about like, hey, this is going to end your life in a significant and meaningful way. Not like, hey, we might disagree over a gray area of following Jesus. Does that make sense? So we have to say something. And then secondly, here, here's the second thing I want you to hold on to. We cannot treat people who are struggling with sin and fighting against it. We can't treat them the same as people like, oh, I don't even care. It's fine. Like, it fe I feel good. It's fine. I don't want to talk about it. Can I just tell you, like, at some point in your life, you will deeply struggle against some sort of sin. You want to know why I know that? Because you're a human being. And that's what this life of faithfulness is like. Right? Paul says that we live with this old self that at any moment we can lay down with. We get it equally wrong when we beat those people up as they're trying to chase Jesus. Like I've, I've sat and talked with someone. They're like, Philip, that person smokes a cigarette. I'm like, yeah, but you know what God's already done? <laughs> like, like, do we want people to be free from addiction? Yes. Yes. Do we change overnight? right? Just because your things are hidden and other people don't notice doesn't mean that you're entitled to point out all the things that other people may be falling short in, right? Just because they're obvious. I just want to encourage you in that. And so that's how we treat this. Like when someone struggles with sin, we don't throw them out. That's not what Paul's saying. It's someone who refuses to repent, who boasts in it and be like, ha, look what I can do. Look what you can't. All right. Let's finish this up. Verse 9. Paul's going to finish it up by saying, hey, the answer for those outside the church, is it the same as the answer for those inside the church? Absolutely not. Let's pick it up. He says, I wrote to you in my letter. So this is not Paul's first letter. I don't know. We think he wrote five, if you're really curious. Who cares? Anyway, we, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or swindlers or the idolaters, since you, then you would need to go out of the world. What's the only way out of the world, guys? Yeah, we all go out the same way. But now I'm writing you not to associate with anyone who bears a name of brother, like saying follower of Jesus, part of that family, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, a swindler, not even to eat with such as one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not those inside the church whom you are to judge. Is it not those who, can you go back? I got to say that right. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Just stop. You, you got it? Purge the evil person from among you. Paul's teaching is exceedingly uncomplicated and clear. Paul did not want the Corinthian Christians to expect people who are not yet followers of Jesus to live like they're followers of Jesus. Do we get that? 
It's so plain. I don't need to explain it. It's not complicated. And I'm going to say there's a temptation in every generation for the last 2,000 years for Christians to think that the solution to the world's problem is to hide from the world. Can you hide from the sinfulness of this world, people? Why not? Why not? There's a clear answer. Why not? Because it comes from inside of us. Do we get infected from sin? No, we're born in with a sin nature, right? You could hide your kid from the world for the rest of their life. Are they going to pick stuff up? Yes, because it comes from the sinfulness of our very selves. It's not a disease we catch. It's a nature we're born with. It's called original sin. And now I want to be clear. Are there things, that, for, the, for the two of you thinking, but are there things in the world that we need to stay away from? If you like to drink too much, should you stay away from a bar? Absolutely, right? If you like to eat too much, should you stay away from a buffet? Probably. Right? It doesn't, but I, I'm just saying, just because something might, just because there are people making poor choices doesn't advocate us from our responsibility to go make disciples, even if we don't like the things that they're doing. We all have an individual part to play, and each of us follow Jesus where he's leading. And as we do, we're able to share the gospel with a myriad of different people, right? We all have our different sin natures. I could spend a week in a bar and not ever get tempted to being drunk. Like, it's just not a temptation. Everyone's got their own temptation. Does that make sense? Like, we, like there are other places I should not spend a week, right? At the buffet, I would be enormous, right? No, but, but I'm serious, right? There, there's also this grace that God's given for certain things to not be a temptation for each of us and other things to be really hard. All right, we're going to finish with this thought. Go ahead and throw up my last slide. I need you to know that the gospel always calls us to do three things. Paul does it in this passage. Every single play time when Jesus' good news comes, it calls us to do three things. The first thing is to repent. Does that make sense? So to turn. When you're 98, will there be places for you? To, okay. When you're in your 80s, those in your 80s, are there still places in your life to repent in your 80s? Yes, my 80-year-olds are nodding. So yes, I'm telling you, until we go home to be with the Lord, we will repent, believe, and follow every time we talk to Jesus and engage with his word. So I want to encourage you to know, hey, what way are you prone to miss the mark when it comes to talking about sin inside the church? Does that make sense? Are you... Do you tend to miss the mark by wanting to correct everything and think you're deluded to know everyone's motives and that your job is to be like the, the moral police for all people, even if they're not like actual sin things, you just really don't like it? If that's you, is that okay if that's your wiring? Yes. I'm going to say yes, because God can redeem that. Because we need people who aren't cowards to actually help us when we're going 100 miles an hour to a wall. I need, <laughs> if we just have a church of rebels, this church will collapse. Does that make sense? We need people, not just wired rebellious, right? But we need people wired like, hey, like you, you objectively can't do that. You can't say that. That's sin. This is plain teaching of scripture. You need to repent, believe, and follow. Yes, you need to do it. No, it's not your job to do that in all the places that you go for people who don't yet follow Jesus, they need to hear the good news before they choose to lay it all down, take up their cross, and follow him. So I want to encourage you, if that's you, great. Great. I'm so glad we need you. We can't go where God's calling us to do without you on the bus. And you got to protect everyone from that broken part of yourself that wants to pick everyone apart. So you repent. You only die on hills that Jesus tells you to die on, which means you have to know what the hills are in the gospel that we die on. And you die on no hills other than that. And then you walk in fidelity and faithfulness. I'm going to tell you some of the greatest transformation I've experienced in my life is because an older believer who loves me and is for me has called me to something greater. Right. Rarely was it the person who just loved me for me, but the person who saw more that the Lord could do. Second, you rebels, listen up. You can't be the end of uh, self-identify. I absolutely love breaking rules. Like my wife's a rule follower. I'm a rule breaker. My middle child loves to break rules. I see it and I giggle and I shouldn't, right? But I think it's hilarious. But, but all to say like, 
We can't correct nothing. Does that make sense? Right? It's okay to like breaking the rules, like we're good for the people wired religious, but can we sometimes get a little self-righteous when it comes like, hey, I can do that. And anyone like think like someone tells you not to do something? Wait, who told me when someone tells you not to do something, you really want to do it? Yes. Okay, good. You know who your team is, right? If you have that urge, be careful. I'm serious. Repentance for those of us wired wired rebellious is that our final authority is not believing Jesus, but believing ourselves. Can I tell you the problem with that? What, 30% of what you believe is wrong? What's the problem with that? You don't know what that 30% is. (laughs) Right? And for those of us who are we have to be really, really, really not careful to not walk like this man did in this passage. Or we have to be careful to correct nothing in the people around us' lives. Right? Is it loving to not warn someone if they're going to crash into a wall? Like, is it, there's nothing loving you hate. If you do that, you hate them, rebels. You hate them. Because only people you hate do you want destruction to come to their life, to your natural self. So that's how we're finishing it today. I just want to encourage you. Like, the way God made you is the wiring God made you. There's a purpose and a plan and a way that you can walk faithfully with Jesus to be part of this. Now, if you have three people in mind (laughs) as your application that you want to tell them to stop doing bad things sleep on it for a couple of nights and talk to me if your list is more than three people, right? <laughs> is, that, is that fair to say? You might want to do some introspection on logs in your own eyeball at that point. And if you never say anything, maybe someone in your life is just waiting for you to ask a hard question to bring keys of life and abundance and transformation to the heirs. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so thankful for the high call of the gospel. Lord, I'm thankful for the uniquely gifted people that you have brought here. Lord, to form us into the people that you've called and created us to be. Lord, we're grateful that you use broken vessels for beautiful things. Lord, we're thankful that it's not our strength, Lord, that points to your glory, but our weakness made strong through the power of your redemption, Lord, and your grace. Lord, may we be a place where people experience your grace. May we not judge those outside. May we welcome them with a welcome of the gospel. And may we press each other on to greater faithfulness to you and your kingdom and your holiness and your righteousness. Lord, would you bring freedom and hope and blessing. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen.